Hello, my name is Jesse Burbank, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending this evening's program. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Mem members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student who would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of tonight's presentation will be available on our website soon. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Finally, if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall and they can assist you. And now, please welcome Barbara Ballard. Good evening and thank you. Can you hear me okay? And, you know, thank you for our last present. You know, I was standing here when we welcomed you in September for our very first program. And I'm not sure where the semester went, and I know those of you are wondering about Thanksgiving next weekend and the holidays are coming as well. I say all that to say thank you so much for joining us for all of our programs, and we appreciate it very much. Before I introduce our guest, I would like you to just turn on the back, because I always ask you to look at that. And tonight I would just like to say, if you're looking for a unique gift this holiday season, give a Friends of the Dole Institute membership. You know how good the programs are, and I want your friends to know about the Dole Institute as well. And I would also say to you, our spring programming will be coming soon. You know we don't announce it this early because we are still confirming people that are coming and we're trying to bring you the best programs possible. Again, it's just a sincere thanks on our part for joining us and making this a wonderful semester. For our program this evening, uh, Emancipation, Lincoln and the 13th Amendment with Michael Vorenberg. Before I get into his introduction, I would like to just say to you this evening that we have guests from the University of Hawaii with us this evening. And they are actually here at the Dole Institute um, because they want to establish Senator David Inouye Senatorial Library and Institute in Hawaii. And what better place than to come to the Dole Institute of Politics to get ideas about how it was done. And I'm sure they'll have an you know, opportunity to talk with the chief architect that helped with this building. And this evening he said he had a little bit to do with it, but you all know Warren had a lot to do with it. And so I think they will find out that not only do we have one of the best institute of politics and our programming, but our archives and everything else to enhance Senator Dole and tell his story so that it will live long after all of us. And I hope that you will find your visit here. So could I ask you please, our guests from Hawaii, to stand. <laughs> now with our evening, Lincoln and the 13th Amendment. Michael Vornberg is a professor, associate professor of history at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and his work focuses on the legal and constitutional history of the Civil War era of the United States, the laws of citizenship, and the transition from slavery to freedom. You will see his degrees. He has a AB 1986, AM 1990, PhD from Harvard University. The author of Final Freedom, the Civil War, the Abolition of Slavery and the 13th Amendment, which was a finalist for the Lincoln Prize. He is also the editor of the Emancipation Proclamation, A Brief History with Documents. Currently, he is completing a short monograph on popular and legal structures, struggles to define an end to the American Civil War, as well as a longer study of the impact of the Civil War on American citizenship. He is a recipient of fellowships from the American Council 
on learned societies and the National Endowment for the Humanities. At Brown, he has received the McLaughlin Prize for Teaching and the Romer Prize for Advising. We all know how important advising is. If we advise our students the right way, they can finish college earlier, but they learn a lot and they also know how much they can pack into their schedule so that they come out with what we consider an outstanding education and all universities strive to do that. Ed Brown he has received, as I told you, his teaching award and for advising. And from 2004 to 2007, he was a member of the Brown Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. It is a topic that I think we all are interested in. It's one that even when we visit today, anything from civil rights and what's going on in this country, it has its implications, not just long ago, but what happens today, every day, in the United States and around the world. With that, it is our pleasure this evening to welcome Michael Vornberg. Thank you so very much. Thank Warm you. round of applause. And I turn the program over to Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute of Politics. Mike, welcome to the Dole Institute at the University of Kansas. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the Dole Institute. And thank you all for coming on what is not the nicest evening. So it's good to see such a, a, a large and long uh, crowd uh, <laughs> coming into the building. Yeah. Let's start with your personal background. Tell us a little bit about how you were raised and educated and then how you decided to become a historian. Uh, I'm very much a child of New England. Uh, so I was born and grew up in Massachusetts. And uh, you just heard my resume there. I went to college only 20 minutes away from where I went to high school. And, and so I ended up at Harvard University, um, where I studied as an undergraduate classics and history. And my real interest in history came from the study of ancient Greece and specifically Greek, uh, Athenian, Persian relations in the classical period. So that was my entrance. And then I did a little dabbling in US history along the side. Um, so I didn't know I was going to end up studying American history and certainly not the Civil War or Lincoln. Uh, I knew at the end of college it was time to get out of New England and try something else. And so I went as far away as I could and still in the continental US. And that was in San Diego where I taught at a private school, a small school for a couple of years where I was teaching uh, some world history but also did American history. And in the teaching of American history, I realized how little I knew and how much I more I wanted to know. So I went back to graduate school this time in American history and ended up working with David Donald, uh, who is a great Lincoln scholar and was at that time writing a biography of, of Lincoln. And I ended up as one of his research assistants um, on that book and taking a number of his courses. So I suddenly became, uh, in a way it had not been anticipated, a, a Civil War and Lincoln scholar. OK. We're going to have your book uh, on sale tonight. And I would encourage everybody to pick up a copy and uh, Frankly, it's Christmas time, so you might want to pick up a few copies for friends. Uh, but how did you decide to write the book? I was immediately interested in the topic of emancipation. It's, I think my first paper in graduate school was on the topic. Uh, and I was struck by an anomaly, a strange thing, which was that uh, you ran into this phrase all the time. Uh, in high school, I had run into it. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free a single slave. Now, that's actually a controversial statement, but it's said all the time. It is said because it is a proclamation. It, it had questionable legal standing. Uh, Lincoln himself pointed this out often. Uh, and at the same time, we learned that the Civil War uh, ended American slavery. And so this seemed to me a contradiction. If the proclamation didn't end it, but somehow slavery ended, uh, what exactly happened uh, that brought this about? It was a kind of puzzle. Now, the short answer is the 13th Amendment. And luckily, because of Steven Spielberg, um, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining what this is uh, anymore, because so many people have seen the film. But it's actually a much more complicated question, because the amendment is certainly the most important of the measures passed after the proclamation. But there's a lot of things that happened during the war uh, that have to do with emancipation. A lot of pieces of legislation, uh, a lot of action on the ground in terms of what's going on with the army, with the slaves themselves, uh, at the state level. 
so it's a very complicated story, and I began to realize why people hadn't fleshed this out because it was far too complicated. So I ended up focusing mo mostly on this 13th Amendment um, and how you get from what is a wartime proclamation issued by a president of questionable standing to a, an amendment that had, requires obviously a supermajority in Congress and a supermajority of the state's ratification, which is not ratified until the war is over. Um, you know, the movie can only take you so far. So it takes, uh, Spielberg's movie takes us uh, to April when Lincoln is assassinated and then back to Lincoln's second inaugural. It does not take us as far as December of 1865 and it's not till then uh, that the 13th Amendment is finally declared ratified. So that's a long process, and so I wanted to write about that. So that's how I came to write this book. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's not assume everybody saw the movie. Actually, let's do a show of hands here. How many actually saw the movie? Well, quite a few of you that's, saw the that's movie. So, um, kind of talk, though, about Lincoln's role in getting the amendment passed and how that might have been different from how other presidents approached some of their initiatives before Lincoln. Well, Lincoln's role in getting it passed is the main subject of film, and that subject picks up the story in late 1864. In December of 1864, Congress comes back into session, uh, and it has, uh, there's just been a national election that has re-elected Lincoln on a platform that has endorsed this amendment. Lincoln has publicly endorsed the platform and the amendment by this point in December of 1864. And then the film is about what he does behind the scenes, and, and that is important, and I'll come back to that. But I think it's important to step back a bit. So that's December of 1864. The Emancipation Proclamation is signed by Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. So what we have here is an almost two-year gap uh, where there is no 13th Amendment that Lincoln is working for. So one of the things that my book is about, and and I'm not trying to be contrarian when I say this, uh, is that Lincoln was relatively late to the 13th Amendment uh, compared to many others. When the, uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation is, is um, issued, right away, abolitionists and others are saying to Lincoln that something else is needed. And there are two different types of arguments. One is, um, as the movie tells you, the proclamation doesn't go far enough. Uh, it, it only reaches certain areas, does not reach, for example, into the border states, uh, places like Kentucky and Missouri where there are many slaves. Uh, its legal standing is not clear. And so abolitionists certainly want uh, some kind of measure that will have clarity and ideally permanence that cannot be overturned uh, by a Supreme Court, so that would mean an amendment. Uh, and so that's one push. But then there's this, uh, and I'll st one more word about that push. It's a grassroots kind of push. Uh, obviously, the people who had the most vested in it are uh, people who are now fighting in the Union Army, who African Americans, many of whom had been slaves. So they are very interested in this uh, the emancipation being permanent. But the, the people who really are pushing hardest uh, are women who are activists uh, for abolition and for other reform, the Women's Loyal National League, they circulate a petition uh, by spring of 1863. This petition's going everywhere. They hope to get a million signatures. Uh, they don't get quite that many, but it's an ambitious effort uh, to have what they call a universal act of emancipation. So this is going on at the ground level. This is early 63, months before Lincoln gets involved. So uh, that's really an important thing to talk about with the passage. Uh, the other push is coming from a very different direction, and that is the Democrats, who are, in a sense, uh, the enemy, if you will, in the North. They're not really, but they are the opposition party. And the biggest Democratic complaint against Lincoln is that what, so much of what he does is unconstitutional, right? They're always very worried that the, uh, he's shutting down newspapers and arrests of people. But they are also interested in these pieces of legislation or proclamations that could be unconstitutional, and they say the Emancipation Proclamation is such an unconstitutional thing. Lincoln invokes the war powers. He invokes the war powers to say that this gives him the authority, and they say this is going too far. You need to rest this kind, certainly something of this reach, 
on firm constitutional ground. That is the Democrats' line. And so they are the ones pushing for a more solid law. And they are actually uh, the ones who are best known by this time for pushing constitutional amendments. So this is a little backwards from how we think about it. Because we normally think of the amendment as a Republican measure, and it is. Uh, but the Democrats play a role in making sure it's cast in this form as a measure that is an amendment to the Constitution uh, that can be unquestionably constitutional. So they, they're involved in this. Lincoln is pushed, uh, for example, in uh, late 1863, he's advised in his annual message to Congress of December of 1863 to endorse this amendment. Uh, he says, no, um, uh, I'm not going to do that. Now, one of the things he says when he says that is, shows why Lincoln is so brilliant. He says, the amendment will do as well without my endorsement as with it. He knows that he has become a symbol uh, of the Republican Party and that if this becomes the Lincoln Amendment, then people might oppose it just for that reason because he has a lot of political enemies. Sometimes the best political thing is to say nothing. Uh, if you really want to help an amendment along. And I think Lincoln knew that, and that was the best thing he could do at that time. In late 1864, a year later, the situation has changed a lot. And I can talk more about that, but I've already talked a, a quite a bit. But there are two things that have changed in that year. One is, is that um, Lincoln now feels that there has been a mandate because of the election of 1864. The other thing is he realizes he has a really quite remarkable opportunity to get this amendment passed later. The movie depicts this. If Lincoln had done nothing in, in that period covered by the film, the amendment still is going to get passed because in March of 1865, Lincoln can call a special session of the Congress, which is now going to have a supermajority because of the election of 64, and he can get this thing through easily. So why does he push it now? Uh, of all times, and it is a remarkable thing. And, and the movie, I think, nicely gets into many of these reasons for doing it, which includes pushing for bipartisanship, trying to get more Democrats into the Republican Party, um, and also to get emancipation settled and off the table so it will not be a negotiable term uh, in any negotiations that might happen as, at the end of the war. And so Lincoln does a lot of politicking for it in a backroom way, which he never had done for any other measure uh, until this one, although he does a little bit for the national bankruptcy law, uh, excuse me, the national banking law a couple years before. Now, can you go into a little bit more depth about that? Because I think that's a very significant part of your book and uh, of the film and of history. What exactly did Lincoln do tactically, strategically, that, that maybe right. other presidents hadn't done to get initiatives passed before? Well, he... Uh, Here's part of the problem and part of the fun. We, we, we don't really know the whole story of what Lincoln does. Uh, he covered his tracks very well. And uh, this is one of the places where the film gets it right uh, at the beginning. It slips a little bit towards the end. But where his Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, says, look, um, I'll do the work and you'll keep your hands clean, but I'll do the work of, of doing the deals. Uh, that's the way it works, and of course, that's often the way it had worked before Lincoln and afterwards, that Lincoln gives his tacit consent to, okay, make this happen and use my name and my power to make it happen, uh, but I don't really want to know the details. Okay, so what can you do? Well, the, the key thing that Lincoln has at his disposal and his administration has is patronage. Um, there are a number of Democrats in the Congress who are lame ducks. They're going to be out of a job uh, come March of 1865. With the federal patronage, um, they can be offered positions uh, in the federal government. Or, this is a more informal thing, the Republican Party at the state level and the local level can endorse Democrats for certain office. So these are the powers that Lincoln has at his disposal and that Seward will use for him and others. Uh, Seward is just one of his agents or his lieutenants working on his behalf. So uh, there's a Missouri judgeship. So here's Lincoln at his greatest, I think, in, in his deal-making qualities. And this is not in the film. There's a federal judgeship in Missouri. Um, and it has to be filled. 
And uh, you know, the filling of federal judgeships, that's been in the news a bit. So we're used to this. Uh, and so there's the same deal there. But this is, after all, he gets all these letters saying, give this judgeship to this person, give this judgeship. So this is where the president can use his patronage to influence people or to win allies, right? So there's a federal judgeship in Missouri, and he's got people writing in. And um, he hears that uh, this person will uh, vote, a Democrat will vote for the amendment, will support the amendment if he is promised, if he's given essentially a say in who will fill this judgeship. All right, so that's a classic political deal. What does Lincoln do? Lincoln says to his agent, uh, to one of his workers for the amendment, leave the judgeship opened. Don't fill it. And in this way, we can promise it to all sorts of people <laughs> simultaneously. And uh, this is brilliant, right? I mean, so this is taking a small little piece of your war chest and using it for everything it's got. And so he gets this congressman to believe that he's going to get the judgeship. Well, OK, the amendment gets passed, and now it's about, Jane, uh, it's about February, and, and Lincoln gets a letter from this guy saying, OK, I'd like to appoint this guy it's now. And uh, Lincoln said, sorry, we've already promised the position. What are you going to do? He can't, the amendment's already headed to the state. So this is Lincoln played these kinds of games. Now, there is nothing illegal in that. That's politics as usual. You can find presidents doing that going way back. I mean, Andrew, John, uh, excuse me, Andrew Jackson made this famous, but there were people doing it before Jackson. Jackson made it really institutionalize uh, the use of patronage in this way. Now, did bribes get paid? This is ultimately where historians have wanted the smoking gun. Did money get paid, as the film suggests, uh, to people uh, to buy their votes? Um, certainly, promises of jobs were made. What's funny, and the movie doesn't show is, as I said, a lot of times those promises were not kept. But that doesn't stop people from promising them. Were bribes given? No. No one has ever found evidence of money exchanging hands. There was a rumor of a fund that existed, a bribe slush fund, if you will, that could be used uh, to pay bribes. But all I've been able to track is someone uh, saying, well, how much of that money was used? And somebody said, well, some dollars were used for expenses, uh, train rides to Albany, because a lot of this stuff is going on in New York. Um, and that's it. And this person was shocked and said, that's not how the way things are supposed to work. But that's, uh, it, there really wasn't that much uh, money, if any, e exchanged in, in this way. Uh, so much more, it was jobs promised. And the other thing is that the presidency is such that when Lincoln knows he wants something done, even without a promise being made, if, if you want a favor in the future, you support the measure because then you can come calling later and cash it in. And that's, that's what Lincoln hoped and that's what he did. So when he brought people in, and he did this on a few occasions, he brought fence-sitting Democrats in a couple times right into the White House and said, I want you to support this measure. That's all he said. But behind that statement is a statement that you do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. And he doesn't have to say that because everyone knows. And it's a favor to be collected at a later moment. So that was the way it worked. And really, it isn't that different from today. Now, the movie, of course, has fun with this in the character played by James Spader, uh, who's a wonderful character based on a true character, uh, who was indeed a, a, a sort of a cad of a fellow. Uh, but it goes, it emphasizes those people, and there's no problem in that because they are a lot of fun. But the more consistent way, it just isn't, doesn't make for good Hollywood drama, is this more informal log rolling system. Mm -hmm. Mike, you mentioned that it's not all that different today. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is about 100 years after this occurred, a political scientist named Richard Neustadt wrote a book about presidential power where he basically said that a president's power is based on his power of persuasion and influence and not on those things he can simply order someone to do. Was Lincoln one of the first presidents who kind of illustrated that? Uh, I think so. I think that's right. And certainly when Neustadt wrote that book, even though he was a 20, he focused more on the 20th century, right. uh, I, 
I took a course with Newstead. He, Lincoln, Lincoln was uh, one of his heroes. And uh, yeah, and, and for that reason, and that, um, look, the power of the presidency in the 20th century, in the post-45 period, is nothing like it was in Lincoln's right. time. It was so greater. I mean, first of all, the bureaucracy is so much bigger. The, the, the patriotism, which I just discussed, uh, the, the, the gifts to be given are, are greater. But also, the office of the executive is so great that when you talk about presidential power, you really are talking about a serious, serious uh, degree of power. The army is so much bigger and so forth. The armed services, I should say. So it, it's a different scale, I should say that. So Lincoln is operating in, era, in an era where persuasion more than uh, direct power is, is really what he has to use. Uh, when he does exert direct power, uh, there's going to be a problem. But he was ideologically opposed. And, two presidents exerting power. Let's remember that Lincoln grows up a Whig. He's against his identity. The only thing that really joined the Whigs when they were created, the only thing that unified them was hatred of Andrew Jackson. Uh, and, and that's an ideologically position only in that it was this notion that if the president exerts too much power in a, what might seem an arbitrary way, because Jackson had, had done some very striking things, this is not a good thing. So for Lincoln to turn around and do uh, things that were powerful wasn't really his nature. And the things he did, he did because he was a war president. And we didn't get to see Lincoln as a, as a peace president. So it's, it's hard to know uh, whether he would have behaved this way. But most people have, have argued that he would not have behaved in that, in that same way. And as I said in that example of sometimes saying nothing, he realized is the persuasive thing to do. Um, that was Lincoln, and uh, he, he knew how to work people in this very quiet way and with humor, uh, and he'd been doing that, really, he learned it in, in Illinois uh, long before he came to Washington. Mm -hmm. When you finished the research and the writing of the book, what were two or three things about Lincoln's leadership that stood out most to you it related to the passage of the 13th Amendment? Lincoln uh, is often characterized, uh, maybe not so much now, but when I was um, young, there, there was this dual Lincoln. He was, in many ways, a hero. But the negative side of Lincoln was always a line that went like this. Uh, he was only a politician. He was only a politician, which is to say he was an operator, which is to say he wasn't really guided by morality. Um, I was struck by the moments uh, where Lincoln uh, essentially could have been only a politician um, and forsaken morality, and it wouldn't have cost him much. Uh, and, but he didn't do it. He held to the moral line. And, you know, the movie captures this in a way, uh, even though it's distorted. But the point is this. The, the movie sets up a what is actually a false historical tension, but it gets to the point anyway. The false historical tension is that Lincoln had to choose uh, between either ending the war, stopping the bleeding, or emancipating slaves uh, and the 13th Amendment. And he chose the moral route of emancipation. Now, that's actually a false, um, it's false. Uh, that is, there was no way the Confederacy was going to stand down uh, if they were promised no action on slavery. The Confederacy was in the game for Confederate independence, and anything short of that, uh, they could not settle a peace. Jefferson Davis could not settle a peace. That was known. Lincoln knew it, and that's why he knew all these negotiations were politicking games. So, in fact, peace was not at hand. But the moral dilemma, or the, I should say, the dilemma between the morality of emancipation on one side and uh, practical politics on the other, that was there for Lincoln. And it's more striking, not so much in the 13th Amendment, it's a little bit there, but it, earlier, uh, in the summer of 1864, it's a little bit complicated, but the, Lincoln is being baited, and he knows it, uh, by Confederates who want him, who, excuse me, who want to uh, spread the false information that if Lincoln would only give up emancipation, the Confederacy would come to the peace table. Therefore, Lincoln's insistence on emancipation is the only thing uh, that is prolonging the war. The Confederates want to spread this so the Democrats will 
uh, get more voters and that Lincoln will be uh, unseated and McClellan will be put into power and will negotiate at the very least a ceasefire, if not an, an outright peace. That's the strategy. Lincoln knows it. So the way they're going to bait him is by uh, trying to get Lincoln to state his terms of peace and to have stated in his terms of peace uh, emancipation as a term of peace. Lincoln does his best. Uh, they, they do this by playing on a New York editor, Horace Greeley, who's a sucker and gets sucked into this game. And I can talk more about this in detail, but Greeley insists that Lincoln make a statement of his peace terms. Now, the politic thing to do at that moment was for Lincoln to say, um, I have no terms, I will let Jefferson Davis dictate terms first. That would be the politic thing to say, or the more politic thing to say is, the one thing I demand is union. Absolutely, there must be reunion. Let Jefferson Davis um, dictate any other terms. His advisors, Lincoln's, adv Lincoln's advisors, tell him to say that. Put Davis on the carpet, make Davis say that the real issue here is disunion, and you'll put Davis in a corner. That's all that Lincoln has to do, but he doesn't do that. He says, he writes a letter that say, I will listen to terms of peace so long as they include union and emancipation. He, when he writes that letter, he knows it's going to be public, and he knows it's going to hurt him politically, and it does. It becomes campaign document number one for the Democrats, who then use it to say, you see, he's using the emancipation issue to prolong the war, and it really ruins Lincoln in, in his uh, campaigning, so that by August of 1864, he is certain that he's going to lose the war, in large part because of that issue. Things turn because militarily things turn. Sherman takes Atlanta and some other things. Uh, so it doesn't work out. Lincoln does the impolitic thing for moral reasons. And that really strikes me uh, about that moment. That moment is taken forward to the 13th Amendment uh, in the film. And so it does capture Lincoln in this way. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about your book and the film. How did you first find out that, uh, that the work of your book was going to be heavily utilized in the film? Uh, very late. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a surprise. Uh, I did not get a call, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not at all bitter about this. It's actually very, to me, I'm just mostly amused by the whole thing. Uh, I didn't get a call from 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 uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, wh whose daughter was at Brown at the time, but at I uh, my, my university. So I I don't know. I, he, I, he didn't ask for permission, right? <laughs> no, but actually, you know, I do want to talk about that because um, later on, which is, you know, to what extent is a book different? Uh, let's say Spielberg was writing a book, right? Uh, and 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 he didn't cite my book and used it. Would I have the same? kind of amusement. No, I, I, think, I think books and films are different. And I think it's maybe in the questions, I'd, I'd like to hear your opinions about this too. Um, you know, films don't have footnotes, and it's a good thing too. Uh, you know, I, I, like, I like movies. I like to go to the movies and not have to worry about footnotes and such. And if you want to stick around for the credits and see, you know, who, if anybody was consulted, great. But, you know, most people don't. And I think that's, that's fine. So the way I found out about it is that a uh, grad student of mine said, did you know that this movie on Lincoln's coming out? I said, yeah, I know, because it had been in the works for years. Um, and uh, he said, do you know it's based mostly on the 13th Amendment? And I thought he was pulling my, my leg. And so I went to um, inter Internet Movie da IMDB, Internet Movie Database, where they list uh, credits beforehand. And I saw the names of characters uh, in the film. And they were the names of very, very obscure people who were crucial in passing the 13th Amendment. There are these people like played by James Spader uh, who play roles in my book. And I said, oh my goodness, this really is going to be about the 13th Amendment. So that's when I began to, to know, only then. Uh, and, then um, and then that was it. And then I waited for the movie to come out. And then when the movie came out, it was a very strange experience because I was watching things I had written about acted out on screen. Uh, and I wasn't, again, it was mostly just, that's really cool. Uh, you know, I, this is why I'm not a screenwriter, because I couldn't do that 
Uh, I could put it on the written page, but I couldn't do that. Uh, and so that was it. Uh, then some other things happened, um, uh, which is that a reporter at the New Republic, um, uh, a, a writer named Timothy Noah, a reporter, uh, mentioned my book as something that should have been credited. And then there was that story then caught on to Salon. And, and suddenly, uh, I was seeing my book talked about uh, in this way. And I, I thought, OK, that's fine, and, and no big deal. And I wrote a letter to Timothy Noah and just saying, just a thank you. Hey, that's very nice. Oh, you know what it was? He, um, uh, he put my book. Uh, so there's the best books of 2012. And he, his contribution was the best book of 2001 that should have been read in 2012. <laughs> very clever. Uh, and so that's where I, I started writing. And I wrote him a thank you note. And then suddenly it snowballed. He quoted from my note and wrote another much longer piece because the Academy Awards were approaching. And here's where it got interesting for me as I thought about this, was that uh, Tony Kushner, the screenwriter, who I thought really did an excellent job, um, was nominated uh, in the non, uh, excuse me. OK, there are two categories for screenwriting. One is uh, an original screenplay, and one is a screenplay based on, on adapted, right, adapted screenplay, adapted material. Thank you. And Kushner was nominated in the second category, screenplay based on adapted material. And Timothy Noah at the New Republic picked on, up on this for another story. And he <laughs> said, adapted from what? Uh, because Spielberg optioned uh, for Doris Kearns Goodwin's book for many dollars before she began writing the book, because he knew correctly that this book was going to do very well. And that book only has eight pages or so on the 13th Amendment. And so he was saying, well, this is kind of interesting. Why this category? If it's not adapted from Goodwin, then what's it adapted from? So it's kind of interesting that these categories exist. Lincoln is adapted in part, very much informed by Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, but it's, it is original in many other ways. So it kind of led me to think about what is a screenplay? You know, to what extent uh, is any screenplay a true work of fiction or adapted? And then if it's adapted, do you have to cite all your sources? And eventually, Noah demanded that Kushner list all of his sources, which you know, I think Kushner, I know. He wrote many books, uh, read many books in, in the writing of the screenplay. Mine was certainly one of them, and he said it. Uh, but he read a bunch of other stuff. He did more uh, than a lot of screenwriters do in writing historical drama. So I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. On the other hand, should he be doing more? Should he be very, be very specific? Uh, in many places, he chose things that were not accurate from one source because they make for such great stories. So do we call him to task for that? And it's a, an interesting historical or screenwriting question, I guess. Uh, but I don't, the stakes involved are not that great for me. It was just sort of fun to watch the whole thing play out. Yeah, but l let's dig a little bit deeper on that because there was a fair amount of controversy uh, involved in, in sorting out, okay, what was the principal source for the movie? And I know a lot of writers have commented, along with one you just mentioned, that your book was more valuable really in the end than the other book. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, must be true. <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, valuable, okay, so they, I think my book was certainly more valuable and probably the most valuable when it came to the nitty gritty of how uh, the amendment gets passed. There are pieces uh, in the debate on Congress and pieces of Lincoln talking to people and his lieutenants, whether it's Seward or other people, ta Ashley talking to people, that um, certainly uh, my book was a source for. But remember, I got this stuff from other sources too. Uh, and I've got footnotes that tell you where to get it. So am I the original source? I guess, I mean, I think that my book was probably being gone to more than any other for those materials. But there is a lot of stuff in that film that is about Lincoln the man. How did he behave? And of course, they spent a ton of time on this. Well, what would he have sounded like when he spoke, right? I mean, and this is where the filmmakers really should be taken to task. You know, they spent millions and millions of dollars to know what the couches in the White House look like. But they decided not to put any African Americans on the streets of Washington, despite the fact that there were Freedmen's Villages uh, in the place. I mean, this, these are the kinds of deci decisions they made that are very interesting in classic Hollywood. Uh, so 
that's an issue. But who Lincoln was as a man, as, uh, as a president, there's a lot of that in Doris Goodwin's book, absolutely. And um, my book is certainly no better on that than, than others. But on the nitty gritty, yes. Um, so I, I think, you know, to the extent there was a controversy, I, I think that's probably a little strong. There was a controversy, there were some controversies over this film that were real controversies. I'll, I'll speak of one in a second. I don't know if that was such a controversy, only in that um, those who I think felt that Doris Goodwin was getting all the credit thought, well, that's not right. And whether they thought it was wrong because I deserved it, or whether they just don't like all the credit she constantly gets, uh, is the issue, I think. Um, and I think it's more the latter. Uh, why should this person get so much credit? She's in the opening credits, I think. Um, when such a small part of her book is, is, uh, is on the 13th Amendment? It's a reasonable question, but you know, I think that's, that's fine. I, I, I think my book was probably used a lot. But controversy that, again, is interesting is um, that I mentioned there is a controversy. The fun one is the, the one with the Connecticut uh, congressman. So in the voting on the 13th Amendment, the first two congressmen to vote are from Connecticut. So quickly, the historians, this is what gives historians a bad name, uh, if they have a bad name. They get into the details and say the voting wasn't done this way. Connecticut didn't vote first. You know, that's like, okay, they got the number of buttons on General Grant's uniform wrong. That just, that gives us a bad name when we point those sort of things out. It's true, uh, Connecticut did not vote first. But that wasn't the controversy. The controversy is they have the two con Connecticut congressmen who vote, voting against uh, the amendment. And a cur uh, then current congressman from Connecticut uh, issued a protest publicly, wrote a letter publicly to Steven Spielberg saying that all of the congressmen in the Connecticut delegation voted for the amendment. And this historical inaccuracy did a terrible disservice to the poor nutmeg state, uh, which deserved the credit uh, for supporting emancipation. <laughs> Mind you, by the way, Connecticut during this time had regularly voted against African American suffrage um, while other states uh, were supporting it, uh, and had issued uh, resolutions against African American equality in all sorts of ways, but let's put that aside. This person wanted to make sure that Connecticut was on the right side of the slavery issue. But the public letter is wonderful because he said, not only do I want an apology from Spielberg, I want this fixed when the film goes to DVD. <laughs> and I thought, well, what we could have here is a kind of cottage industry for history undergraduates and graduate students, right? <laughs> so a film comes out that gets history wrong. You got a few months before it goes to DVD. Go in, splice it, fix it to, uh, to get the facts right. Now, I, I, I thought this was kind of a, and, and you know, he did not fix it. And I don't think Spielberg ever gave a response. Uh, but that was a controversy short-lived. And it's the controversy, by the way, which the, the, the promoters and the makers of Spielberg claim was part of a smear campaign to make sure that Spielberg, uh, that, 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 that the film, Lincoln, did not win the Academy Award for Best Picture. That they were serious about. That I got a little window into. They really thought there was a smear campaign. And, that's, and that the, uh, uh, the Oscar went to Argo, another historical uh, drama. And, um, and part of it was this belief in the smear campaign and partly in this controversy. But never you know, was this notion that somehow Vornberg got uh, mistreated and that's why he shouldn't get the Oscar. I didn't hear people saying that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one other question and then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers from the audience tonight. Can you tell us, Mike, what you feel the lasting legacy of Lincoln and his leadership on the 13th Amendment are or is? I wish the legacy were stronger today uh, than, it, than it had been. Um, when I wrote the book, I was quite struck uh, by the people putting aside, not everybody, but crucial people at crucial times putting aside partisan differences. And I know you've now heard this rhetoric so much. Can't we put aside partisan differences? And we live in these times of partisan roiling. It wasn't that different in the 19th century. I mean, the parties were vicious. In fact, elections were often much more vicious than they are today. 
But in this moment, um, of course, the film depicts that the, that the Democrats who supported um, the 13th Amendment did so for mercenary purposes, maybe, you know, if not outright bribes, which isn't true, you know, for political office or whatever. But in fact, many people came to the side of the amendment already before Lincoln did. Many Democrats, many Union um, Party people in the border states came out of a moral sense that this was the right thing to do. And Lincoln cultivated that. Lincoln used that moment. He wanted that to happen. Now, he had programmatic purposes. He wanted to expand the base of the Republican Party, to be sure. But I think that that moment is something that I thought was important for people to remember. Um, and uh, of course, we, we live in an era where it's very hard for any president uh, to cultivate that kind of bi bipartisanship. The, uh, the obstacles are tremendous, um, made somewhat easier by the big news today about the filibustering rule uh, being taken aside for judicial appointments, but judicial appointments only. So there's still going to be the same kind of partisan wrangling uh, going on. Lincoln was a party man. He was that way in Illinois. He understood how parties worked. He understood that they were important. He never was one who said, we need to get rid of parties, they're bad. Uh, he, but he understood that there were issues where parties worked together. And that's just the nature of politics. And he loved that. He really loved that. Uh, he could love that and love moral purposes at the same time. It seems to me that the generation who's watching people in Congress now uh, thinks that you can't do both. You, you can't be, right, you can't be uh, someone who has sort of have larger moral aims and be a politician. You just can't do both. And that's too bad because I think Lincoln teaches us, uh, among other things, uh, that you can. So that's, that's one thing in the style of leadership, which isn't always forceful, but, some, but much more often is very indirect and sometimes is absolutely non-active at all, knowing that if he's uh, a lightning rod, step aside and let other people uh, take charge. So these are the things that I'm quite inspired by Lincoln just to begin with. I mean, there are many other things about the Lincoln myth I could talk about, but in writing this book, those are probably the things that I was most moved by. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A. If you've got a question, raise your hand. Amanda or Alex will uh, find you and uh, give you a chance to pose your question. We have a lot of students here, guys, I would encourage you to take advantage of this. Some of you may be writing papers or something, so take advantage, stick those hands up in the air. Professor Vorenberg, I wonder if you could talk about the role of African Americans in the creation of emancipation and creation of freedom during or after the Civil War. So the, um, one of the issues I stepped into once I started working on a book about Lincoln and emancipation was that uh, there was a, I'll call it a debate, but there was a, it's sort of a debate among historians uh, about who freed the slaves. Uh, and I, I mentioned that phrase because it was the title um, of an essay uh, that, uh, well, it actually started with Ken Burns's uh, Civil War series. I think that was really a triggering moment, which came out now it's been more than 20 years ago that series came out, which is very much watched. And uh, Barbara Fields, who's one of the historians in, who was interviewed in that series, said on camera and then in her essay in the accompanying text, uh, wrote an essay, Who Freed the Slaves, which said that African Americans are responsible, are the most responsible agents for the fact of emancipation, that they aren't credited enough, and that they need to be seen as the primary agents rather than Lincoln. Um, a few years later, James McPherson, probably uh, one of the great Civil War scholars working in the academy, uh, wrote an essay, actually it was based on a talk which I saw him give, and then it became an essay on who freed the slaves, making the case for Lincoln. And it, it's kind of a, both sides, well, I don't know about Fields, but certainly McPherson would say it's, it's kind of a illusory debate. That is, uh, Lincoln played a role, African Americans played a role, and getting into the game of who's more important is doesn't really work. Uh, you can do it, but it, it only gets you so far. African Americans did play a crucial role uh, in their own emancipation, there's no question. However, it wouldn't have happened without the war itself um, and uh, without the army. Uh, African Americans are very savvy if they're enslaved. They always had been. Uh, they didn't just run away unless they knew there was a place to run to. So once uh, they are in belief that 
emancipation is the policy. Uh, and they believe that, by the way, many of them, as soon as Lincoln was elected. And they should have believed it, right? Because their owners had said, if that man's elected, all the slaves will be freed. So they've been hearing this for months, and then they hear that Lincoln's elected. It's a natural assumption that they're free. So then the question is, what do they do? Well, so what's key then is, where are their federal forces encamped? And before the war breaks out, they're encamped at federal forts. And so they start presenting themselves at forts long before Fort Sumter. Uh, and they're turned away because the Fugitive Slave Law is still in effect. So they don't get emancipated in this way. But once it becomes clear, and the networks of communication exist among African Americans, that, uh, that if they present themselves to Union uh, camps, they won't be turned away. And this begins to happen on the ground very early in the war, and then becomes policy by 1862. Uh, they, they start running away in large numbers. Both things have to happen. You have to have African Americans who are ready to leave the plantation, ready to escape, who are not the docile people that pro-slavery ideologues had said they were, uh, and the many Northerners believe they were too, by the way. And you need army uh, or navy in place, uh, places to run to. So they play a crucial role. Now, that gets you to emancipation, but it still doesn't secure emancipation. And if you said to African Americans in 1863 after the proclamation, what do you really think you need in order to have true freedom? I don't think a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery would have been their number one, uh, number one on their list. They would, and they did, demand service in the military, which they were getting, uh, because they knew that military service always had been and would uh, be a kind of guarantee of a citizen, uh, some kind of claim to citizenship. Uh, the second thing, of course, was the right to vote. Uh, which they uh, would not get uh, but for a while, but they got sooner than most post-emancipation societies. And the third was, of course, land. Or at least as what they wanted was access to land that was as easy access as whites had under the homestead policy passed in 1862. Um, a reasonable request. And uh, made sense. There was land being confiscated in the South. So these are the things that for them meant security for freedom more than a constitutional amendment. They supported the constitutional amendment, to be sure. But these other things probably had a higher um, priority for them in terms of real protection of freedom. OK, we have a question back here. Uh, yeah. Uh, like you said, the Emancipation Proclamation was kind of tenuous at best. Uh, I was wondering if it would be more or less considered a uh, economic war power for the president, or whether or not it and what, what, sorry, and if it kind of justifies any other kind of uh, intervention by the executive nowadays. It was invoked under war power. You said economic war power. Um, okay. Can I just ask you if, why you said economic war power? I just want, because uh, I think I know kind, what you're getting uh, at, but to I want to sure. To distinguish, I guess, between like, oh, hey, we're going to send troops here and, you know, this amount of days, that kind of thing, like the uh, war, powers, uh, war Powers Act, okay. but kind of just to add a right. kind of different take. So, it, well, you bring up an interesting issue. First, it does act in that way as a true War Powers Act because the Emancipation Proclamation includes language that talks about um, former slaves and blacks generally being enlisted into the army. So that is an act, uh, that, that is a war power issue. But that's, gets at the fa uh, getting away from that, emancipation is the single greatest property sequestration uh, in American history. Uh, no question about it. Uh, properties had real value, and they still did. Uh, and I could talk more about that if you want. There were still, uh, for example, claims being paid out for slaves taken from loyal people in 1867. So, they had real property value, and when emancipation is put into place, that's a taking of property. Okay. Does the federal government have the, does the president have the power to take property in this way? Lincoln thought about this a lot. So that's maybe the economic piece of this. Um, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution is where we find the so-called takings clause. It's, uh, so if property is taken, right, compensation must be paid. This is what we often think of with eminent domain law. So if a highway goes through your backyard, you have to be paid the value of what your property is now depreciated. So Lincoln knew, he, he was a lawyer, he knew this, he worried quite a bit uh, about compensation to be paid to loyal owners. And he did a lot, and I can talk more about that, to make sure compensation was paid. So when, when uh, the slaves were emancipated in District of Columbia in uh, April 1862, 
the government paid loyal slave owners for the loss of their slaves. Uh, if, you took a, if you were a slave owner and you took an oath that you were a good union person, your slaves are now free, but you were paid government uh, money for your slaves. I, I've often called this the first really big government buyout. Uh, anyway, but that's, uh, and the later Lincoln still is hoping that compensation will be paid to loyal people. Now for the disloyal, for the traitors, that's what he called them, the people who had committed treason, they were not to be paid for their slaves. That is a great taking. Now, the legacies of this, there are many, right? So this is a president and an administration, a judicial administration, uh, that's uh, taking the takings clause to a new level. If you're guilty of a criminal offense, which what is treason is, then your property can be taken. Uh, that law was still being worked out and would still have to be sort of figured out into the 20th century. For example, um, did, was it a blood crime? Did your uh, children uh, not get any claim to this property, any part of it? Lincoln worried about these things. So that economic issue was on Lincoln's uh, mind very much. The last thing is that um, the Emancipation Proclamation has in it a phrase that I do this as an act of justice, act of justice. That phrase comes from international law. Um, it's an old phrase in international law from the 18th century, the philosopher and, and treatise writer uh, Vattel. And it speaks to war powers um, and a legal code that under the uh, act of, under a war, certain things can be done because of this concept of justice. That is the entry point for all sorts of things done during the Civil War in terms of codes being passed, laws being passed about what can and cannot be done. Because uh, if you can take slaves, what else can you do? And so the legal treatise writers start getting into this during the Civil War and after the war. So things like uh, by, by five years after the war, the phrase war crimes is now in place. And by the 20th century, people are looking back to the proclamation as a crucial moment, not just for emancipation, but for international law uh, and what law is in wartime. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, uh, what do you think Abraham Lincoln's attitude <coughs> would be today toward the, the various voter ID laws and, and its implications toward voter suppression? So the, the question has to do with today's voter ID laws and the implications it might have for voter suppression. Um, it's always hard to, to speak for Lincoln today. Um, and I, of course, many questions are asked of this nature. What would he do about this and that? And I think they're perfect, you know, perfectly reasonable questions. You know, voting is an interesting one because it gets at some of the fundamental differences between Lincoln's time and ours. There really is a fundamental difference. I mean, voting in Lincoln's time was clearly a local and state matter first and foremost. Uh, and Lincoln, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates and then later, is always saying that when it comes to the vote, it's really up to the states that are going to decide who gets to vote and who doesn't. So um, when Lincoln was president, there were states in the north that, uh, most of the states, excuse me, most of the states in the north prohibit any kind of black voting. New York had a law that said you could vote only if you uh, had $250 of property, which was a lot of money at the time if you were, if you were black. Um, Lincoln never ever said anything against these laws. And it would have been strange for him to do so. Uh, the people who said things against those laws were known as outright abolitionists. So uh, that's an important thing to remember. So would Lincoln have had any issue with locales or states imposing certain restrictions on voting? I think he, in terms of his idea of where power lies to restrict voting, he would have no trouble with that. On the other hand, uh, Lincoln was no fool, and he knew discrimination when he saw it. And so, for example, when he was um, invited at various moments to become a know-nothing, that is the party uh, that was basically uh, anti-Irish and anti-Catholic, um, basically anti-immigrant, uh, or to say words or to endorse movements that would perhaps draw people from that, the American party or know-nothing parties, to the Republicans, he refused, and he said, he gave very powerful lines. I wish I could quote them verbatim. 
about why, look, if you start making distinctions like this on the basis of, in the case of immigration, it would be like, okay, you have to have been here this many years instead of this many years. Um, that road can, is going to lead you to very wrong places, to the place where we now have slaves. So Lincoln made his position very clear on that. And uh, so if he, if he could be convinced that these laws were in effect while looking to be race neutral, ethnicity neutral, were in fact uh, targeting certain types of ethnicities or types of immigrants, he would say, no way. And I don't think it would have been very hard to have convinced him uh, that this was the case. But uh, of course, these laws have to be ethnically neutral, race neutral on their face. Okay, we have a question back here. Uh, thank you for speaking tonight, Professor. Uh, you've spoken a little bit about how many northern states tried to limit African American rights, uh, such as in New York or Connecticut, and it's, of, it's often generalized that the North was fully in favor of abolition and emancipation, and the South was against it. But what, what was the true feelings of the North, and were there regional distinctions, or um, what were their true feelings on the matter? Uh, there were many northerners um, perfectly happy uh, for the situation of 1860 to have continued uh, and for slavery to have persisted. Uh, they were not happy about slavery moving to the West, in large part because they wanted the West to be reserved uh, for white people who didn't own slaves. Um, and so that was a major concern. So that was their true feelings. Um, and when emancipation begins to happen, there's a lot of fear that uh, a lot of fear that if in, that if uh, emancipation comes, uh, that these people will leave the South, they'll come north, uh, the former slaves, and this will be a problem. In Illinois, for example, uh, Grant experiments with this for a bit, uh, and he takes a number of freedmen, and he actually has them um, uh, boated up uh, the the Mississippi and settled in places in Illinois, and the reaction is incredible. This is southern Illinois. Um, uh, against this, a fury in this area of Illinois uh, against this. Indiana, uh, so regionally speaking, it was the lower Midwest where you could find this kind of anti-black sentiment the clearest. Uh, Indiana had what we call black laws on the books until 1865. These were laws that included the uh, infamous Negro immigration law. You were not allowed to simply come into the state of Indiana if you were black, unless basically you could post a bond uh, and then you could collect your money on the way out, basically, so that you weren't supposed to come and reside there. Uh, blacks not allowed on juries and so forth. I could go on and on about, about the discrimination taking place. So uh, there was real concern in the North uh, about emancipation. And actually the film, Spielberg's film, captures that a little bit. Um, and uh, Lincoln had some concerns about this too. Uh, but the army solved this problem for the moment. Uh, that is, so long as the war was going on and African Americans who were freed uh, went into the army, the, the prospect of a huge black migration north wasn't really there. And of course, blacks did not migrate in large numbers northward, um, in part because uh, they didn't have to, uh, in part because they knew uh, things weren't so that much better up there. Uh, so it was a factor and a huge factor. And there were still, I mean, the, the most famous pro-slavery tracts, uh, literature written during the war, were coming out of New York State. Um, so it, 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 it was, slavery was very much, and uh, let me put that differently, S the support of slavery, uh, the rhetorical support, and the economic support was national. Absolutely always had been, uh, and it still was uh, during the Civil War through much of the North. New England was something of an exception, but I think as a New Englander, we New Englanders are always quick to don the, the hat of we were always the best and the most moral, and it's not true. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Southerner Robert Penn Warren called this uh, the treasury of virtue, that Northerners, he really meant New Englanders, felt like they could always invoke, the tr uh, draw from the treasury of virtue, they were always great. Uh, well, in fact, uh, as I said, Connecticut had a lot of these uh, anti-black anti laws. Uh, Massachusetts was okay, but um, in fact, there were some, well, I, I won't get into too many details about this. 
But you're talking about a, a region of the country where there were very, very few African Americans, except in the countryside of Connecticut, when, when you talk about New England. Okay, I saw a couple of hands up here. Here's, here's a hand right here. I thought I somebody, saw somebody flash their hand. Uh, There's a mic right there. I have a question uh, regarding citizenship and the 13th Amendment. <clears throat> in the recent debate on doing right with illegal immigration and so forth, it was mentioned that there are only two countries in the world that have this, uh, a citizenship law that says if you are born in that country, you are a citizen. The United States is one. There are other countries, so-called democratic countries, where citizenship is hard to come by. Switzerland is that, is that country, which always surprises me. In the debate over this uh, illegal immigration, the idea of citizenship was brought up, or the notion of citizenship was brought up, and it was tied to the 13th Amendment, and I fainted. <coughs> Can you explain to me how that was tied in with the 13th Amendment? You know, I would, okay, so the question here is about citizenship and the 13th Amendment and if these things are tied up. Now, I'd have to see what you read because um, the 13th Amendment says nothing explicitly about citizenship. It's not in there. The 14th Amendment, which um, passes Congress in 1866, ratified 1868, in the first sentence of that one, that's where birth, that's where it says, if you are born in the country, you are a citizen. Then it talks about other way, at born or naturalized. So it could be the 14th Amendment where this came up. But your larger question is important, which is um, you said that only two countries in the US and one of them uh, have laws in which um, if you're born in the country, you become a citizen. Well, I, again, I'd have to see the source. But that's, if it says that, it's not true. Um, in, it, if you are born in the U.S., you are a citizen, but that is the norm in most countries in the world. Oh, it is. It is. Uh, I've actually, uh, uh, I've had a couple students work on this and uh, about what the rules of citizenship are. I can't tell you about Switzerland. Uh, they've always been impermeable to me. Uh, no, I, I really don't know about the, the Swiss. But um, the, treasury of the Swiss treasury of virtue, that's right, nothing, nothing happens. They've also got a great treasury of art, I hear. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> So the, uh, the, 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 the norm, and it doesn't really come from the U.S., actually it predates the U.S., is, is birthright citizenship. Now we can talk about that. Does that really make sense? And um, well, it's, it's, only, it's already been six years or so since McConnell and others suggested, this was a very short-lived moment, that we, rev that we have hearings on the 14th Amendment. Um, to suggest whether this birthright clause makes sense. Uh, okay, now, if it did invoke the 13th Amendment, it would have been for this reason, that's still tied up in the 14th. Under the 13th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is passed to enforce the 13th Amendment. The Civil Rights Act, the 13th Amendment emancipates slaves um, and has this other clause that says Congress shall pass whatever legislation is necessary. So they passed the Civil Rights Act. For complicated reasons, the first sentence of that Civil Rights Act has that sentence in it, that if you're born in the country, you are a citizen. So you're sort of right that indirectly, the 13th Amendment leads to this birthright citizenship, which is the first time it's put into federal law in statutory form. Um, so uh, that is, in a sense, an origin. And then the 14th Amendment takes that piece and puts it into a constitutional amendment form. So that is actually the norm. Now, there are these other ways of getting citizenship in other countries, and it's fascinating. So if you want to become a citizen of, of Russia, for example, it turns out to be incredibly easy. Uh, and the, unsurprisingly, the pattern is economically driven. The places that uh, want workers that are desperate for labor have easier citizenship laws. And the US follows this exactly. That's why they have a guest worker program. They want the labor, but they don't want to give citizenship. But one other piece of this on the immigration issue, which I found fascinating, I think it was in yesterday's New York Times, and probably more widely reported than that. It turns out that many of the immigrants in, in this country um, who are citizens, technically, have done nothing to get that citizenship formalized. 
they just don't see it as a priority to go to the court or wherever they need to go uh, to get the papers. They just don't see it as necessary. Now, should they? Um, after 9-11, they sure did. They went in large numbers. Uh, but it's kind of this trailed off because of the, that heightened security has trailed off because they can live their lives in the ways they want without necessarily having to do this. And there's concern that if they go and become citizens, who knows what they'll then have to report or whatever. It's a really interesting article. So you can maybe look at that if you'd like. OK, I have time for one last question. If somebody wants to pop up a hand real fast. No hands? OK, Mike, thanks so much for coming Thank tonight. You, it's terrific. Yeah. Thank you all again. Thank you all for coming out. Don't forget, we got Mike's book on sale, and he's going to be signing them out front in just a few minutes. So thank you all for coming out tonight.